All right, so um, we will now head on to the next segment, which is we'll have the different representatives from the breakout groups um, to share uh, the highlights from the discussions. So maybe first invite the first representative, Dr. Felicia Shaw, to share more on the discussions that took place in the food and water security breakout group. Dr. Felicia, please. So, so good morning, everyone. And uh, I will be reporting on some of the findings from uh, the group that was discussing uh, food and water and all water security. And first of all, uh, we have to thank our uh, experts, uh, Bo and Margaret, uh, for facilitating so wonderfully. Um, also the participants of that uh, session for giving so many views and for being so thorough and comprehensive in their considerations. So we had six questions, and I'm going to take us through uh, them in two blocks. The first block was around um, how can climate services support resilience and sustainability? How would this flow through into improved decision making and then it, to share on existing initiatives? So some of the key points from that were in supporting resilience and sustainability, climate services can first identify hotspots. Um, farmers are actually noticing change uh, in the climate and are a little bit motivated to use the data, but it comes down to very practical things such as can it uh, be used to uh, help with their cropping calendars, um, are there ways to link climate services which can be rather technical to traditional information that can be digestible by farmers, and then to provide things like early warning systems for irrigation areas. An improved decision making, uh, it was driven by the need to have research and to have access to resources for farmers, uh, to have multi-time scale, uh, and to enable long-term decisions. So it can come down to you know, creating scenarios where you can inform the farmers whether they need to uh, pivot to a different livestock, for example. And then from the government perspective, uh, calculating water allocation to different uses because there are many competing needs for water. Uh, there was sharing on existing initiatives, such as you know, creating champions within the communities whom others can learn from, uh, really brilliant use of technology, apps, etc., to navigate um, change. And then there was an example shared from Laos where there are near costs and seasonal forecasts available online, but the farmers actually access information better through community media, community channels, uh, even things like loudspeakers that are in the villages. Uh, the next uh, block of points revolved around uh, you know, tailoring, customization, challenges, and collaboration. So I'll take us through uh, the first question. And one thing that was cross-cutting through this discussion was the recognition that farmers are not a monolith. Farming communities are extremely diverse. The capacity varies greatly. There are wealthier farmers or companies who actually understand these things better than the very smallest of the smallholders. So this recognition permeates through the discussion. Um, so in climate services being tailored to cope with extremes, uh, the, the discussion group thought that you have to tailor not just by community and geography, but by specific crop type to be effective and impactful. The dissemination channels must also match the stakeholders. So there was this nice sharing about dial a weather or using telephone, analog telephone. You know, press one if you want to, if you're from this region, press two if you need some kind of forecast. And there are other ways of dissemination, such as through community centers or even TV weather forecasts. Communication is really key. Translating the data, respecting the stakeholders, making things accessible to them, whether it's through town halls um, and to customize that flow of information. And then another area where you know, we, we think a lot about climate services, met data, et cetera, but at the last mile, there may be collaborations and provisions needed to um, pre-position insurance and welfare services in readiness for disasters. The next uh, set of questions was what potential collaborations can we initiate 
uh, to help these communities. So one nice idea was the idea of forming networks, because we mentioned that even amongst farmers, there are different uh, capacity levels. So farming groups with higher capacity might be able to communicate to smallholders, which are adjacent, and then lead by example. They could work collectively, and maybe even governments and institutions could create tools and platforms to facilitate that. Um, there was a nice uh, example, I think, that uh, I'm not sure whether it was Thailand, where they said that when they want to communicate effectively to smallholders, they might make use of pop music or, you know, a celebrity. Um, another area of collaboration is research. When we think of research, we often think of quite technical and uh, involved research, but what about citizen science? What about data sharing that flows from the farmers back to the policymakers? And that requires a lot of consultation and stakeholder engagement to understand. Um, so I think we mentioned food reserves before and lost mile impact. Um, Nature-based solutions was also uh, an area of collaboration, and that usually requires cross-sector knowledge. Um, another idea was providing market data to farmers, because if the extremes are happening and if they're impacted by uh, climate change, what's going to improve their lives is if they can sell their produce at the correct prices, and that requires you know, economic and market data. Um, resourcing the farmers may also come in the form of translating R&D outcomes. It shouldn't remain just in a kind of ivory tower, not being used, so the universities might make better use of that or try to proliferate that information to the farmers, and then there might be funding mechanisms for the farmers to be able to uh, use that innovation. So the final um, discussion area was on key challenges that we foresee. And one very salient challenge is generational mindset, which is past generations have farmed in this way, you know, using traditional practices. It takes a lot of effort to shift people from this area. Um, and this is particularly difficult for the lowest capacity smallholders. Um, there needs to be higher risk awareness. The lack of risk awareness is, is a stumbling block in implementation. Um, other challenges include data, lack of data availability, lack of updated data, um, and lack of integration of the data from you know the kind of farming level to the national level. Uh, we're gonna, I'm going to use the word lack a lot. So the next two points were also about the absence of common standards and regulation, uh, and we need to develop these. Um, lack of harmonisation between agencies. You know when you have a silo between the stakeholders, it it impedes collaboration, impedes that knowledge being proliferated. And then lack of capacity. So the gap between you know, the farmers and the experts is quite large. So there needs to be improvement of literacy, uh, or farming practice literacy, and improved consulta consultation between the farmers and Met offices. Um, there was a recognition, a really good point was made, that ultimately there are limitations to adaptation at the community level. So when things need to be escalated to a national or even international intervention, there, there is also room for MET climate services to inform that long-term uh, projection and planning so that, for example, if you know sea level rise is going to severely inundate this area of farmland, it's not something that a single community can cope with. It needs to be escalated. So uh, with that, I'll kind of close um, our summation of the food and water segment, and, and thank you for everyone who participated. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Felicia. So now we'll move on to the next uh, topic, which is heat and human health. May we invite Mr. David Green and Ms. Beatrice on the stage to give a sharing of their group. Hello everyone, um, thank you very much. Um, just to introduce myself, my name's David from a um, company called Vista Health here in Singapore. Um, mainly tend to work on infectious diseases and human health. Um, I'm very interested in this topic. And Hello, my name is Beatrice. I'm a researcher from SMU and I do uh, heat research. 
Excellent. So our session today was focused on uh, uh, how climate services can integrate more with human health. And we had a particular focus on uh, key areas such as uh, heat. Um, so one of our first discussion points was to actually start to identify the specific human health uh, challenges and risks that might be posed by climate change. So we identified a few areas amongst our groups, um, including heat injury. Um, these could be acute events, um, acute emergency events, or the chronic impact as well. Um, and as the science is catching up on an understanding of this, uh, this feels like a particularly uh, pertinent point where we don't have all the answers and so ongoing research will be needed. In terms of infectious diseases, um, there are risks that climate change have on um, vector volume, for example, um, mosquitoes that can transmit dengue, chikungunya, yellow fever, or um, other vectors such as uh, other mosquitoes that can transmit malaria. All of this is very dynamic um, and changes quite a lot, and we're seeing uh, huge impacts in other countries outside of ASEAN, uh, in Europe, the US, etc., where this is a particular problem. Where humidity changes, um, there are key issues in terms of disease transmission, um, for example, uh, influenza, um, COVID as well. Uh, so the impact of climate change can't be understated there. There are non-communicable respiratory um, problems that can be exacerbated by climate change as well. Um, so these could include, for example, asthma, COPD, but also climate change and the way it impacts the environment in terms of um, particulate uh, distribution and exposure, dust, etc. This is also a key problem that can arise. Renal health um, and cardiovascular exacerbation, um, both existing and pre-existing and uh, new conditions. Uh, dermatology uh, and skin, skin problems, so acute events such as burns um, from higher UV, UV exposure, ongoing risk of cancer and also exacerbation of uh, pre-existing conditions like psoriasis, uh, eczema and the like. Mental health was a key topic that came up, um, both in terms of the health of the individuals and distress conditions, the sense of well-being and also cognition as well. Um, and I guess neuro neurological would have been a, a linked topic there. And the way climate change can actually increase the risk of injury uh, was also a key topic, uh, how that can cause uh, you know, bone breaks, um, skin tears, wounds, et cetera, et cetera. And so some of the key challenges that we saw uh, arise from these were how we can actually uh, better address disaster response, um, both on an occupational level, uh, for example, in construction sites, but also on a public health level as well. And the communication of this risk will be critical. And this is where we saw climate services playing a key role in simplifying, and we'll touch on this again, in simplifying those complex environmental uh, concepts into uh, easy to digest points. Data access is also uh, a challenge and how we can process this data and also broad set analysis as well. So how we can look at taking healthcare data either from electronic medical records, HR data from, um, from the occupational setting and trying to look at how we can provide a broader value appreciation from the climate services perspective too to look at deeper correlations and aligning on terminology and concepts so that there's consistency between both sides. So for the next question, it's about how climate services can help. So it's about co-creating and co-designing solutions uh, between the climate services as well as the uh, healthcare industry. So it's about identification of stakeholders, not just um, um, looking at ministries, um, those who look at um, governments, uh, looking at infrastructure, as well as talking to the general public as well. And it's very important that we base our policies on evidence-based science and we help develop and constantly update our guidelines as well as provide support to legislations that are related to heat risk. Um, action and response plans also need to be um, created uh, for public education with a large focus on reaching marginalized groups as well as isolated communities. Uh, we also, um, encouraging prioritization is also essential so that we target groups that are marginalized. Yeah. Um, we also need to ensure that there is data correlation between climate data and health databases so that there is no accidental misuse of data and to also ensure that the medical site actually understands how best to read the climate data as well. We also need to support communication of complex climate services by um, 
breaking down science so that the public can understand as well as the policy makers as well. Uh, we also encourage the deployment of real-time monitoring devices so that um, we are able to very closely monitor the situation in different parts of, of cities. So how can climate service support public health and emergency responses? So one of the key things that were discussed was the creation of working groups to ensure that there's advanced preparation uh, between uh, different um, uh, sectors of the government. Um, it's not just about the adapting to the and preparing for the emergency, but ensuring that there are mitigation um, put in place uh, for example, uh, looking at utility services and ensuring there's funds there to, um, so that during a heat event, um, um, we don't get a drop in uh, public utility services. Well, yeah. Okay, we also need to support climate event prediction to ensure that people are actually warned in advance and that uh, funding allocation is also uh, well done as well. And we also need to tailor solutions for different demographic groups. Okay, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> thank you, Beatrice and David. So for the last topic on um, urban sustainability and development, we have Mr. Ender Zoziah. Good morning, everyone. Thank you. Okay. I'll try my best to do justice to all the discussion that has been happening in, in our uh, uh, session. Um, discussing about um, the urban development. I think we've gone beyond that, talking about sustainability in, uh, in more generic terms. So these are some of the questions um, uh, that uh, we've used as a, a bit of a framework to, to discuss. A lot of them um, regarding climate services and how climate services can engage, uh, enhance urban planning, infrastructure development, um, how they can uh, support policy making and, and developing strategies. Um, as I said, we've gone beyond the urban element and we've discussed a lot about how to engage communities um, and of course, then uh, we've also uh, tried to tackle on or, or ideate on opportunities of collaboration between uh, climate service providers and planners or local authorities. Um, the team was very um, um, diverse. Uh, we had representatives from different countries, different uh, environments, um, different profiles, also different uh, knowledge, so scientists some international agencies, uh, local agency representatives. So um, we were starting from uh, ident identifying some of the, of the gaps um, in terms of mitigation and adaptation. A um, lot of gaps between the different uh, scales uh, from regional to national, uh, from national uh, to city, even community or district level, uh, sometimes priorities uh, do not uh, converge. So there is a bit of attention uh, solving those. Um, there has been uh, um, a, a discussion and, and, and um, uh, about the, the gaps of, of developing further research and, and um, um, engaging the local communities on that. So we've also talked about some of the existing uh, initiatives. Um, uh, there, it's clear that um, international um, agencies are supporting bridge this gap in many aspects. Um, crime, already climate projections or hydrological projections are being used at the, at the uh, city planning level. Uh, both uh, examples from Philippines and Thailand has been shared. Uh, same in Brunei, uh, where they're using Cordes data or even B3 data that uh, has been recently re uh, released um, by CCRS. Um, and, and then, um, Again, beyond the urban uh, environment, we also talk about heritage. Um, and finally, we've also tried to um, address some of these gaps and trying to identify solutions or suggest solutions. Um, learning from other countries, that's, that's something that uh, some, some of the, of, of the uh, um, local representatives have been shared. Um, 
Engaging uh, local communities, uh, this is an important topic because very often research uh, comes uh, from a, 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 a top-down approach and um, it has been discussed that local communities uh, tend to uh, already have a lot of knowledge themselves and that lack of communication or, or how to communicate that, those research outcomes, those policies, uh, it's, it's a relevant matter. I guess that connects also to yesterday's uh, um, morning discussion from um, Dr. Julie uh, Tranja, where we need a multi-stakeholder approach to, to solve all these issues. Um, Downscaling of, of the climate data will be relevant. I mean, we've seen a, a big effort by CCRS here in, in Singapore. Um, maybe it would be good that, that something like that can be replicated in other areas of, or other zones of interest. Um, and finally, communication, uh, disseminating uh, scientific outcomes. Uh, as I said, community engagement is necessary. It's necessary um, early, in an earlier stage. We should engage with local communities. Uh, maybe even on the research questions and on the uh, research needs uh, from from um, early, so so that uh, we can we can co-develop solutions with them. Some examples have been shared in Singapore. Uh, I think there's a set of ap applications from NEA, um, from um, the health ministry that link uh, climate and health issues. That could be, for example, replicated in in other. Um, in other countries, uh, natural-based solutions. I think on the on the foot uh, track has also been been uh, uh, mentioned. So these are again some of the um, discussions and, and solutions that uh, could be put, uh, could be pushed or could be um, um, uh, suggest in, in different countries. And, and we hope to see uh, further discussions coming out from from this forum and and in the future. So that's it from me.